please feel free to jump in at any time. Today's Halloween, trick or treat, and hopefully there will be some treats here this morning. Today is the one year anniversary of my brother dying. And in fact, since it's, well, I guess it's not quite exactly the hour since it's, he died in California, but I would like to dedicate my uh, talk here today to the memory of my brother David, who was a Christian minister, my younger brother, uh, a much kinder and more loving person than I. Although he was really not made for this world, he really was a, uh, almost like a, a, a Davy or a being from the heaven realms. He didn't really quite know how to make his way in the world, but he touched many, many people with his heart. So uh, wherever you are, David, onward, onward into the light. Uh, I'd also like to, since this is my last time being here alone without Bob at my side, I'd like to just briefly mention a few things about the Living Dying Project. I run an organization in California. Most of you have gotten a brochure. If you haven't, there is much more information than, than is on the brochure at my website, livingdying.org, uh, a website that we are trying to make the go-to website for anyone interested in conscious dying. There are many uh, audio files of talks and meditations that I have done, as well as text files of meditations by Stephen Levine, myself, Joan Halifax, and a number of other people. So there's a lot of great information there. Uh, if you would like to get your friends on the mailing list, there's a place there to join the mailing list. Uh, a couple of other points. Uh, about six months ago or so, I got a, uh, an email from a woman who said that she had been Googling the name of a friend of hers who was her boyfriend in high school. They had both gone to high school together in, I believe it was Queens, New York. And they were best of friends and they had gone their separate ways. And she had just started thinking about him after some decades. And, and in Googling him, found out that, that he had died because there was an article in the Living Dying Project newsletter about how one of our volunteers had cared for her friend, Eric, no, it wasn't Eric, that was another fellow. But anyway, I, f I even forget his name. But he had died of AIDS maybe 10 or 12 years ago. And she wanted to know if we had any more photographs of him, which we did. And I sent her a whole stack of photographs of this very beautiful guy. And she said, I'd like to help you. I'm a network marketer. It's a way of earning funds and, and letting your organization go forward without spending a, a dime. So I had to promise to do network marketing, which means that with, whenever I'm in a room full of people, I'm supposed to say, here's what we do, here's what I do, and if you know anybody, or if you are somebody who would like me to come and do this for another group, let me know. And if you know any way that the Living Dying Project can earn some money or get some grants or donations, you could also let me know. Half an hour before the workshop started, on uh, Thursday, I got an email from a uh, granting foundation, a grant that we were assured we would get, which would have covered two-thirds of our operating budget for the next year, saying, oh, no, we're not going to give you any money. So all of a sudden, I'm back in the, in the fundraising business. So if anybody has any great suggestions about that, that would be greatly appreciated. So that's the Living Dying Project. And as I mentioned before, having some combination of an inner contemplative practice combined with an intimate relationship with death, in my humble opinion, is the best, most powerful way to freedom here in this strange time in which we live. So I, I live in Northern California near San Francisco. Uh, probably not too many of you people are from California. Most of you are from around here. And there might not be anything quite like the Living Dying Project. But even if there is not, you can become a volunteer at a hospice. You can find some organization 
where you can work with dying people and you're not even saying, I'm going to do the spiritual thing. You're just there as a regular volunteer and you're doing the spiritual part of it as a uh, sort of a uh, covert operation, if you will. And maybe even ask the person who's choosing who you get to work with to find the people that need the most spiritual care. So, so far we have been talking in this, in these meetings, uh, Bob and I have almost non-intersecting bodies of information and wisdom, it turns out, which is really a great balance. I, I'm, I'm so honored and happy to be with him and here at Menlo. Uh, I am more from the practical standpoint of what do you do at a bedside, how do you deal with your own suffering, and uh, I have studied Tibetan Buddhism quite extensively, but certainly nowhere to the depth that uh, Robert Thurman has. So I have been finding, and I will just repeat very briefly what most of you have heard, but there are uh, about half a dozen new people in the room here today. I have been finding that many meditators uh, have not really created a foundation for being able to let go of identification with personality structure and character structure and begin to identify with nature of mind. Now, nature of mind, Buddha nature, Christ consciousness, whatever you want to call that, is very important in the context of our workshop here because when we die, as the conversation last night suggested, we die into Buddha nature, we die into our true nature. So that when we're talking about supporting the dying, <coughs> If we are talking about that in the deepest sense, it becomes a spiritual process. Yes, there is a medical process. Yes, there is a psychological process. But uh, eventually, dying is a spiritual process where we die into who we are all along. Now, all the world's religions say that right now in this room, you and I are enlightened. We are filled with that light. That is our nature. And whether we're having a good day or a bad day, whether we're feeling particularly grumpy or particularly happy today, no matter what the content is, underneath the content, or actually more accurately permeating the content, is what could be called luminosity or presence. The body of Christ. And because, though, we are socialized and conditioned and living in what seems to be solid bodies, although physics and biology would tell you that our bodies are very, very far from solid, that we're actually 99.9% .9 space, even though this does seem pretty solid, uh, because we're identified with our solidness, because we are identified with the passing content of our minds and bodies, it is difficult without great spiritual work to come to the, not intellectual, but embodied understanding that we are living truth, that we are that light. So what we have been doing over the last few days is beginning to create a foundation of invocation, compassion, empowerment, uh, concepts that if, if you would like, you can go to my website. There is an introductory lecture, an introductory meditation, which goes into these things in greater depth than I will have time because there is new material that I would like to bring forth today. Uh, however, in the beginning, we learned to be dependent, to be grounded, to inhabit the lower part of our body, ages zero to two. Two to five, we become autonomous, independent, down in our belly center, and then around the ages of seven or eight, which we're going to talk about today, our hearts begin to open in a more conscious way, and we begin to uh, explore the possibility of conscious relationship. Now, this is all very important in talking about dying, because until the heart becomes stable, until we can allow the heart to remain open, 
than this quality of luminosity or Christ consciousness, which is our true nature and which is here right now, will be very difficult, if not impossible, to perceive. Because with the instability of the heart-mind opening and closing, being fixated on the passing content of experience, we will be so fixated on all these things that are changing that we will not be uh, being with that which does not change. So around my neck here, I'm afraid to pull it out because of all these wires I've got on me. I have a string of beads. Each bead is different, but there is a cord. There is a cord that is stringing these beads together. Usually we identify with each individual bead. Here's a moment of happiness. Here's a moment of tiredness. Here's a moment of desire. Here's a moment of anxiety. Here's a moment of uh, on and on. What is it that does not change from moment to moment to moment? And it is very difficult, as I said before, if not impossible, to rest in that until the heart becomes stable. So what is it that does not change from moment to moment is pure awareness or consciousness. In each moment, there is nothing going on except consciousness meeting experience. And as long as we're identified with the object of consciousness or with the subject, rather than consciousness itself, the, the subject and the object that are always changing, we are 180 degrees from the truth. So the Buddhists say, if a tree falls in the forest and there is no one to hear the tree fall, which I guess includes birds and insects and all other kind of critters, but if there is no consciousness there to hear the tree falls, there is no sound. Because sound only occurs when it enters consciousness. Now, if you will indulge me, I didn't think I was going to do this, but let me recount a, a scientific experiment. Uh, some scientists, I don't remember the reference exactly, decided that they wanted to see if people actually had psychic abilities. And what they did was they got some people who seemed to have psychic abilities, and they had a device that shot out subatomic particles that after a certain amount of time would decay into either subatomic particle A or B. And for the sake of the conversation, let's just assume that the chance of going to site A or B is 50%. So there were people that supposedly had some abilities and they said, can you now imagine, can you visualize that as we're doing this experiment that the particles are all going over to site A? And lo and behold, they found some people who could do that whatever that means, but that when they visualized in a highly statistically significant way, particles were going over to side A. So then they said experiment number two. We're going to do the experiment tomorrow. Can you visualize today that tomorrow the particles will go over to side A? And yes, once again, people could do that. Interesting, but not earth-shattering. But the interesting part, the earth-shattering part, was they said, we did the experiment yesterday. Can you visualize today that the particles are going to go over to side A? And what they found out was that if any human being had looked at the result, if the results had gone into human consciousness, all the visualizing in the world could not change it. But if the results were only in the computer and had not entered into human consciousness, then once again, visualizing could change what happened yesterday, which is maybe a funny way to use language. Uh, maybe we're not changing what happened yesterday. I don't know how you would actually language what happened. But I think that says something about the nature of consciousness being a lot more malleable and interesting that we, than we might imagine. <laughs>